if I say hero and I say heroin, I'm not talking about the drug. What's the difference between a hero and a heroine? Male and female. Male and female. The Bible is a wonderful book for uh, children to be exposed to stories and people characters and heroes and heroines very early in life. I was two and three years old the first time I ever went to Sunday school and it was to the Presbyterian Church right here in Bessemer. And the only reason I went there was because my grandmother would call and insist that my father and my mother take that boy to Sunday school. And I can remember two and three years of age going to the Presbyterian Sunday school and hearing the stories of Noah and the Ark. All these Bible characters, David and Goliath. Those stories have a, have a strong appeal for children, especially if they're presented in a fair manner. Three or four years later, when I was uh, eight, seven, eight, nine, I began attending the little local Baptist church right there in Broadmoor. And I loved Sunday school because I got to go through these Bible stories and Bible characters again. And through the years, even in my mature years, I have decided who I, I want to be my heroes or heroines in the Bible. I like David, of course, but I really like Joseph. Joseph is, I think, my favorite Bible character. When you talk about heroines, um, there are many choices. Um, I like Ruth. I think about Elizabeth and Mary and that relationship. They didn't live next door to one another. They were related, but they didn't live next door to one another. And they couldn't just pick up the telephone and carry on a conversation. And yet the relationship between them was more than blood kin because as soon as Mary visited Elizabeth, they both, it says in the New Testament, broke into song. Now, that doesn't mean they were singing. It means they were speaking in, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They both broke into song, which is a testimony to the fact that they loved God, and now they're sharing that love of God. That's wonderful. A real hero... Uh, has something to do with deliverance. Joseph saved hundreds of thousands of lives because he went through terrible experiences in order to come to a high position of government in Egypt. He had to pay a terrible price to get there. But when he got there, God used him to save virtually the whole of Egypt and people from the nations round about, that's how his own family came down looking for food in a terrible drought. Daniel, you can call Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, you can call them heroes, but they're not, not quite the same as Joseph or David. A hero has something to do with deliverance, with salvation. We need to do a little comparison on the board for a moment. <coughs> Let's see, they were both Hebrew. What does that mean? Beside a genetic heritage or lineage, what does Hebrew mean? Down through history, if you were a Jew, you were greatly loved. Right? No. no. The fact that Daniel was Hebrew and John was Hebrew, even though there was about 700 years between them, we need to give some thought and understanding here because Daniel 
was taken captive because he was a Hebrew, he was a Jew. And John, at a certain time in his experience, was taken captive because he was a Jew, he was a Hebrew. Why would God choose a Daniel in the Old Testament and a John in the New Testament with such remarkable circumstances in their lives, even though there's 700 years between them? What else did they have in common? What? Well, we, well that's, that's fine. I should have said captive. A captive means they came and got you. You didn't want to be a captive. It was against your will. But the captive of the superpower of the day. You're, you're paying a price. Yes, thank you. That's a good point. They were taken prisoner by a superpower. The, the leading nation of the world at that time. Now, who was the superpower of Daniel's day? Who was the superpower of John's day? If you're a Babylon and you're a little Israelite, it's kind of like using an atom bomb to get rid of fleas. You understand? Nebuchadnezzar was a general at the time he invaded Daniel's little country. He was not the king of Babylon. That occurred while he was besieging Jerusalem. His father died in a messenger came all the way from Babylon over to where they were besieging Jerusalem and said, your father has died, you need to come home and take the throne. So he hurried home for the coronation and hurried back to finish the job. What was Babylon doing in Israel? I mean, this is, we're, we're talking a little postage stamp, you know, hardly a Rhode Island, if you will. What in the world would a superpower be doing in this little postage stamp of real estate? It was on the way to Egypt. They were on their way to where? Egypt. To Egypt. Absolutely. They were looking for bigger game. Mm -hmm. Egypt was a contestant against them for number one. Well, we can't have that. We're going to be number one. And poor little Israel, Daniel and his kin, just happened to be in the right place at the wrong time. <laughs> Are you listening? We're looking for parallels. And what has been will be again. We hear these sayings, but do we really understand that we're talking about So Babylon was here in this little postage stamp because they were on the way to uh, a, a bigger conquest, a larger conquest, a, a bigger battle. All right? Now we come over here for John. As I understand it, John was the youngest of the twelve. Right? He was the baby of the bunch. <laughs> He was more tender-hearted, I would gather, of the twelve. You've got seasoned, loud-mouthed, cursing fishermen, worldly-wise tax collectors. You've got Judas and all of these other guys. And you've got little John, teenager, and probably an early teen at that. He's the last one of the twelve. He outlived all the others because he was the youngest, but also he lived a, a rather full life. Now you can take into account 
all kinds of stories and some say legends about a John that the Romans tried to get rid of him and couldn't. He was thrown into a pot of boiling oil, supposedly, and he got out of it. That's kind of like Daniel thrown into the lion's den. So we got to make up stories if we are going to make up stories. I don't know if he was thrown into oil or not. It really doesn't matter. The Romans tried to get rid of him, and he just kept popping up. And so where did they send him? Come on. To the Isle of... Patmos. Now, if you've never really looked on a, on a map of that part of the world and the Mediterranean and Patmos is, you know, you can say this is a postage stamp. Patmos was not even the glue on the back. It, it was just, it was a rock. And uh, these are the kinds of places that if you have bad characters, you want to send them to keep them from having anything to do with society and government and whatever anymore. Who else can you think of in history that was banished to a rock island in the Mediterranean? Come on, the French general. Come on. Napoleon. Napoleon. He wasn't banished to Patmos, but just as well be the same, you know. They wanted to get rid of John, so they sent him to the Isle of Patmos. That's a record. We can count on that one. There's no legend there. He's an old man, we reason at the time, and we think that probably the book of Revelation was written between 93 and 96 A.D. Now, when did Jesus die? Back between 30 and 35. So, this is 60 years after Jesus. That's a lifetime in and of itself. John's still alive. He's still preaching. And now, on this rock in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Mediterranean, he receives visions. He receives a vision. And God says to him the same thing he said to Daniel. Write this down in a book. Write this down. Something is to be preserved. And not only that, you have to write it and send it back to the mainland to the seven churches. Now, how do you do that? How do you get mail from Patmos to Ephesus? They had to bring them food, probably. Somebody. Many Bible readers and interpreters of the book of Revelation believe that it was written in a code. And all of these characters and ugly looking beasts and all these things in the book of Revelation were put there by John under inspiration so that the Romans who would have said, no, we're not sending any of that Christian garbage back to pollute the mainland again. It was done in such a way, many interpreters believe, so that it would be like a, a story book. It would be like a movie picture of the day. It would be whatever. And it was just a fanciful writing and that way you could slip it through the U.S. Postal Service. See, How much of that? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What matters to me is that the writing was preserved. What matters to me is that the book of Daniel, in spite of the fact that we really cannot find an original manuscript, but somehow the stories in the book of Daniel have been preserved. The book of Daniel is about the time of the end. Not because I say so, because the book says so. The book of Revelation is clearly about the time of the end because the context reveals that. The time is short. See? Yes. So the context, the context of these two writings is 
Hebrew prophet. The context is somebody is going to be taken captive. Someone's going to be thrown into prison. Whatever. And it's the superpower of the day that you got to watch out for. Whoever pulls the strings of government is who you got to watch out for. Now exactly the same scenario carries here. Doesn't matter if there's 700 years between them or not. Doesn't matter. It's the same story. And it's the same story about the same time of the end. So here's the question. What do these two stories have to tell us or mean to us who live at the time of the end? Can we expect somebody to go to prison? Seized against their will. Forbidden by law to speak. What did Daniel do that he deserved to be taken away in a, in a rope around his neck and his hands and led all the way to Babylon? What did, what did he do to deserve that? Nothing. So if you're treated like dirt in the days ahead, what did you do to deserve it? You're just in the right place at the wrong time. The past can tell us a great deal about the future if we just take enough time to see that it's the same story and it's told twice and if it's told twice what? It's certain. It's certain. We also have scripture particularly New Testament scripture said, that says now all these things were written aforehand as examples unto us upon whom the ends of the world are come. They were written for us and our children, it says. It says. I'm in chapter 4 of Daniel, and I want you to go there so that we can try to decode what is recorded here in chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, this is verse 1, the king... Unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. And that's an interesting verse to start this drama with because it's the very setting that Jesus said, now the end cannot come till everybody, all nations, all people, all languages hear a message. And it may be that there's something contained in this vision or dream given to the King Nebuchadnezzar that has something to do with this message that has to go to the whole world. So I want you to see where the chapter begins. It's not too many verses. And we're going to see when we get to the end of the chapter or the story or the vision or the dream that it ends exactly where it should. Every kindred tongue, nation, and people. Well, let's go on. Verse 2. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. Who do you think is authoring this, this chapter 4? Who do you think is telling this story? Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar himself. Verse 3. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion from generation to generation. Well, it wasn't an everlasting kingdom and generation to generation at the time Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel were around. But it's speaking of a time to come that's evidenced in Daniel chapter 7 in the last three verses. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, mine house, flourishing in my palace. If you're the mighty king, and you've got a royal palace and dough and good food and a big army. I saw a dream. It made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me, the king says. Therefore, I made a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon. This is a repeat of Daniel chapter 2. Brought in all the wise men of Babylon 
that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Now God, who is able to read the minds and hearts of men, knows that there's a lot of superstition out there. And if you were part of these ancient societies and you had a dream or a vision and you couldn't really tell what it, was, it meant, superstition set in very quickly. The gods, are, the gods are telling me something. What are they telling me? Call for the wise men. This dream made me afraid. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. It must have been quite a bunch. I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation. <coughs> but at the last, Daniel came in I like that verse, but at the last. It's always at the last. It's zero hour. <laughs> at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him, I told the dream. O oh, Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, no secret troubles you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I've seen and the interpretation thereof. Now, unlike the vision or dream in chapter 2, this one the king can remember. The first time he couldn't remember the dream. So Daniel had to receive instruction from heaven to repeat the dream and then give the meaning. This time he can remember the dream and he can know that it's very troubling. It's, it's disconcerting. <clears throat> Thus were the visions of my head and my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. Um, I didn't know there was anything growing in the middle of the earth. Did you? So that's not what that is talking about. We don't dig down a couple of thousand miles in the, into the middle of the earth or a couple of three or four or five hundred miles down to the middle. Of, that's not, it's not talking about the middle of the rock. It's talking about in the midst of the earth. I saw this great tree growing. Now, how, how, how well informed are you regarding uh, geography? Over here we have water. We call it the Pacific. And then we have land and lots of people. And it goes all the way around, around, around until we come to water again. And then we have land, but it's not touching yon and it's not touching yon and it's not heavily populated. Well, I don't know if I'll ever figure that one out. A tree in the midst of the earth, the height thereof was great. Now the tree grew, verse 11, it was strong, the height of it reached unto heaven, the sight of it thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much. It was food or meat for all, the beasts of the field, it sought shadow under it, the fowls of heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. Hmm. So whatever is represented by this tree, it's in the midst of the earth. And I've already taken you on a tour around the rock. And there's only one place that you could refer to and say it's the midst. Only one. And it's responsible for feeding and enriching and I have no idea who could be represented here, but I think we're all old enough, that is, mature enough and lived long enough to see enough news and whatever that there's some terrible devastation on some part of the planet, earthquakes, tsunamis, 
And of course, there's someone coming in to help. And they have these bags and bags and pallets and bags and planes and boats loaded with food and medicine. And they come halfway around the world to help. I just, I don't know who that could be. I, I, because everybody on the planet does it. I mean... And by the way, when you see these bags of food, 100-pound bags or 50-pound bags of food, wheat, corn, it doesn't matter, rice, it doesn't matter. When you see these bags, they're typically white and they are stamped with from the people of the United States of America. And of course, we've only done that once. And of course, it's no big deal because all the other countries on the planet do it. It's just a common thing to be done, you know. I mean, Mongolia sends bags and bags and bags of whatever. And no. No. Why, how do you, how can you and I account for the wealth and the richness of the land and the pro, pro, productivity of the land and the people. How can, how can you account for it in all of human history? You can't. Because any nation that could have the ability to feed millions in a time of need and millions more somewhere else and millions more Somewhere, any nation, that would have to be a superpower. Super in the moral sense, super in the tangible, physical, secular sense. What we're trying to find out, discover if we can here, if, if this is about the time of the end, then these superpowers should have something to do with it. Now, it's no secret. I've said it before. I'll say it right now. I believe that ancient Babylon in the prophecies represents the United States of America. I can't find any other to fill the bill. What? No, not supposed to get out. But we're supposed to expect to go to prison. Now there's a, another step in all of this because if you get into the prophetic portions of both Daniel and Revelation, Babylon is not just a superpower. It's, it's a major part of the beast system that's going to be set up. And if I could, I would like to suggest that when the beast system is finally put together, Daniel and Revelation put together, we're going to see Babylon and we're going to see Rome. Now, if we're even slightly read in Ellen White as a, an inspired writer, she speaks of a time in which America will be foremost. That means first. That means leading the way. America will be foremost in stretching her hand across the gulf. Oh, there's the, we're out in the water, see? This tree is in the midst. We're out in the water. And we're going to stretch our hand, she says, across the gulf to clasp the hand of Rome or Romanism in the old world. So when we talk about America, we're talking about new. We're talking about something different, something unique in the history of mankind. Verse 13 says, I saw in the visions of my head on my bed and behold, what does the word behold mean? I looked. Behold, 
I saw, I looked, and saw a watcher and holy one come down from heaven. Now, when, when you get these angelic visitants, they can either come from beneath or from above. This one came down from heaven. He cried aloud. This is what he said. Mow down, cut down, hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Now there's a picture of poverty as opposed to exorbitant wealth. Who's ready for that? I'm not. I'm not. I, I've traveled far enough and long enough to tell you that I don't care to live in a third world nation. I'm not prejudiced. I don't want to live in a third world nation. Why not? Because there's nothing there that's attractive to me. At all. But this sounds as though this nation that is number one, this power that is number one, is going to pass to and keep going. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. So two things I want to point out in this verse before we go on. Um, tell me how you make a battery. Come on. You have to have a positive pole and you have to have a negative pole, right? Uh, it, it, are there some rather simple ways to make a battery? You would want one end to be positive, one pole, and another. Are you aware of the fact that if you take a piece of iron and you take a, another kind of metal, something like copper or brass, which is containing copper, you understand that you've just put a battery together. And you put this band of iron around this stump and this band of brass around this stump, what does it do for the stump? It creates a magnetic field. Coupled with the dew of the earth, that's a description of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You cut the tree down, but you don't want it to die. God doesn't want it to die, so He's going to do something. Put a band of iron and brass around the stump, and do what? Let the dew of heaven water it. So if we're headed, if, if, if ancient Babylon in this prophetic scenario has something to do or some representation in the United States, God is going to inflict a wound upon us. But he is not going to allow us to what? Perish, totally disappear. As a matter of fact, if we keep reading, that's what it says. That's exactly how this is playing out. <coughs> Verse 14, he cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree, cut off the branches, shake off the leaves, scatter the fruit, let the beasts get away and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. So God is going to wound, but at the same time, he's going to provide the salve of the Spirit. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. In other words, this great power is going to be reduced to commonness with the common beasts of the field. This matters by the decree of the watchers, by demand of the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know hmm, that those who are alive at the time this happens. Hmm that the living may know. Let his heart be changed from man's, let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. 
This matter is by the decree of the watchers, by demand of the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And now, verse 17, I want you to see this because we're going to talk politics. Okay? And setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, that's not a very inviting verse of Scripture. I mean, do we really want Hitler in control? Do we really want Caesar ruling the world? Do we, do we really want just the basest of men to control us and everything connected with us? And setteth up, it says, God setteth up over it the basest of men. This is a very difficult time that we have come to. Now what we're about to read in chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, what we're about to read right here is a description of the next person to come to power in chapter 4. Let's see what the next one will be like. Where did we leave off? 17, 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, but Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation. All the wise men don't know. They're not telling me anything. Tell me, thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. He was astonished for one hour. His thoughts troubled him. The king said, uh, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or the interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and was strong, whose height reached to heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit much, then it was food for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and on the branches the fowls of heaven had their habitation. It is you, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Superpower. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one come down from heaven, saying, Hew down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. Let's see what it is that's going to reduce the king and the kingdom to this miserable state. What is it? This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which is to come upon my lord the king. They shall drive thee from men. They shall drive thee you from men. They, if you're a king, has to be other kings, other rulers, other powers. They shall drive you from men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make you to eat grass like an ox. And they shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure. And after that, you shall know that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Do you have any indicator right there in that verse that there's more to this verse than meets the eye in the King James? I have a, I have a little indicator right there in, uh, in mine. This is uh, verse 27. And... Uh, this is what it says in the original. This is what it really says. Show mercy to the poor. It may be a healing of your error. 
So we've all seen some of the graphs. If there's a hundred million dollars to represent the total wealth of the nation, how much of it do all of the people down here own? Negative. The whole bunch of the bottom owns how much? Not even one percent. Not even one percent. You and I are very fortunate to be part of the middle class, which means we're not, you know, we're not rolling in the dough, but we're not rolling in the dirt either. There's something about the system. There's something about the government. There's something about the taxation. There's something about the rulers and leadership of this nation that has allowed this to come to pass and do nothing about it. Well, all they want to do is tax the rich, take 99%, give it to these other folk who produce nothing. I'm not for that either. I'm sorry. That's not the cure. That's not the cure. If you took all of the money, divided it evenly among all of the people, it wouldn't take 10 years and it'd all be right back where it was. And you know that's true. Because some people know how to make money, and some folk don't. So there has to be a better plan, a better system, a better way. Let's see if we can find anything. Verse 28, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. 12 months. That would be one year. At the end of 12 months, he was walking in his palace in the kingdom of Babylon. And this is what he said. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this is what was spoken from above. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like an ox, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He ate grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So verse 34 takes us seven years down the road, down this road. Seven years. Let's get to the end of this story. 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven. Mm -hmm. My understanding returned to me. What happened to his understanding? He went bonkers. He lost his mind. He went crazy. My understanding returned to me. I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion in his kingdom. From Let me tell you something. Verse 34 is abundantly clear. It cannot be read nor interpreted any other way. When these seven years are done, Jesus shows up in the clouds of heaven. That brings sanity to a whole lot of folk. whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. You can find that in Daniel 7, verse 26. And that is the coming Christ, the coming King of kings, Lord of lords. Verse 35 says, And all the inhabitants are re of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay His hand or say to Him, What are you doing? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom and mine honor and brightness returned to me and my counselors and my lords sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me. Hmm. It sounds like somebody learned a lesson. Verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. 
all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. See, the problem, folk, is if there's any truth in what we're talking about here and sharing here, if there's any truth, veracity to it at all, then we're talking about you and me and us and this nation and now. That's what we're talking about. That's who we're talking about. And this means you and I are supposed to enjoy our last seven years in poverty. Some folk even hungry. That doesn't sound very inviting to me. I don't think it should sound ex inviting to anyone. And nevertheless, there is something good that is going to come out of it. Number one, a proud people in a proud nation will take on some humility. And that cannot be bad. But to take great wealth which we have flaunted and throw it to the wind cannot be good. It cannot be good. I cannot, I cannot even imagine a time ahead of us when the United States can scarcely feed itself, if at all, much less the rest of the world. There may be uh, drought and famine ahead. There may be a breakdown in society at the various levels so that you cannot carry on commerce and move things from one place to another freely. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't even like to exercise my mind on the possibilities. Do I believe that's where we're headed? We're virtually knocking on that door this moment. We are knocking on the door of Daniel chapter 4. And we can muse, oh, it's going to be exciting to watch. No, it's not going to be exciting. It's going to be depressing. That's reality. It's going to be depressing. Now you and I and the world and especially this nation, this great nation that we're part of, is headed for some very hard, tough times. And we can blame it on this candidate or that party or whatever. Yeah, no, 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 no. We have come so far, so long, and so deep into transgression and selfishness that we're going to pay the price. I'm sorry. You play, you pay. We're going to pay the price. That's what this dream is all about. Now God's going to take advantage of it because he says three times he's going to pour out the dew of heaven. That is the latter rain. He's going to pour out the dew of heaven on this stump that's left of a great tree. And there will be conversions. There will be new hearts and new minds. There will be. But it's not because of great wealth and great pride and great whatever. I, I just don't think so. So what is the lesson of Daniel chapter 4? That seven hard, tough years are ahead? That I don't think there's any other candidate to fill the shoes of Babylon in the prophecies? I think it's America. I think we're the people. I think this is the time. And I think that Jesus said before this hard time can come and do everything that it's going to do to the people and even this nation, there's a message that has to go to every kindred tongue and people. That's the very first verse of Daniel chapter 4. There's a message that has to go to every kindred tongue, nation, and people. That's who we are. That's what we are. That's what we're doing. That's what we've been doing. That's what we have promised heaven to keep doing. And it's going to be wonderful to see how all of this plays out. The time of man's extremity is the time of God's opportunity. That's Bible. Father in heaven, 
we have come to the season for this time. We have come for such a time as this. We have been privileged in our lives to live in this great nation. In spite of its errors and its pride, we thank you that we have been privileged citizens of a privileged nation. We have been well fed and well clothed. It appears now that all of these blessings, temporal blessings, are going to be stripped systematically. And we're going to have to look up and pray for rain and pray for bread and pray for clothing and pray for whatever our needs may be in the days ahead. In spite of our temporal needs and desires, I pray that you will bless us with wisdom to understand that we have a mission first and foremost. We have a calling first and foremost. We have a work and a duty first and foremost. And so show us what to do and how to do it and then make it possible for us to do this work. We thank you that we can be here today for the blessing we're going to share in a meal now. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.